All right, welcome to Family Bible Time. I don't know if you can see us, but hello. 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 Happy Christmas hello. to everybody. You want to wave at the camera? Hey, wave. Say hello. Hello. This is, these people are all part of the Family Bible Time family. And we are, well, we're with Asara, and we're with the Enwerijes, or Ezekiels, or Marvelouses. <laughs> You're going to be marvellous ears, aren't you? No. Yeah, and then I don't know how to say your last name, Peter. Cyprus. 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 The Cyprus family. Uh, oh. Peter, great to be here with you. We are also in 2 Chronicles, chapter 31. 2 Chronicles 31. And we're in Revelation 17. Are you ready for this? Are you sure that you're ready for an attempt to... <laughs> understanding Revelation chapter 17. Mm -hmm. This is a phenomenal chapter. I'm going to need every bit of extra sand. <laughs> so I'm going to leave that going until it starts and then we'll turn it over. But let's pray and let's go. Father in heaven, we praise and thank you for spiritual food. Thank you for feeding us today. Thank you for giving us health enough to enjoy time with your people. Thank you for blessing us with fellowship this afternoon and food and thank you for the opportunity to celebrate the birth of our saviour we love you lord we thank you we pray you bless our time together now in jesus name amen, amen. amen. oh right two chronicles 31 are you ready yep yeah all right now when all this was finished all Israel who were present went out to the cities of Judah and broke in pieces the pillars and cut down the Asherim and broke down the high places and the altars throughout all Judah and Benjamin and in Ephraim and Manasseh until they had destroyed them all. Think about that now. Ephraim and Manasseh, they're up in the north, aren't they? Mm -hmm. And so this is now the people going out from the celebration of the Passover and they're having a smashing time, yeah. destroying, <laughs> destroying all the idol place, places of idol worship around not just in Judah in the south, but also up in the north. Now, that's, this is a great revival, isn't it? Then the people of Israel returned to their cities, every man to his possession. Verse 2. And Hezekiah appointed the divisions of the priests and of the Levites, division by division, each according to his service, the priests and the Levites for burnt offering and peace offerings for, to minister in the gates of the camp of the Lord and to give thanks and praise. The contribution of the king from his own possessions was for the burnt offerings. The burnt offerings of morning and evening and the burnt offerings for the Sabbaths, the new moons, and the appointed feasts, as it is written in the law of the Lord. And he commanded the people who lived in Jerusalem to give the portion due to the priests and to the Levites, that they might give themselves to the law of the Lord. Now, stop there for a second. What had been going on? Okay, in all the time that the people were not really worshipping God the way God designed it, they were not giving to the giving the food that was required for the priests and the Levites. So what do you think the priests and the Levites had to do all the time so that they could feed their families? Fend for themselves. They had to fend for themselves. They had to go out and get their own food. And so they couldn't do the job that God had given them to do. But now, here's a time of revival, and one of the things that happens in a time when people's hearts are motivated to serve the Lord is that they give, and then the, 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 the priests and the Levites here in the Old Testament and the New Testament in the church to age, the ministers can devote themselves. Did you see that? Verse 4, that they might give themselves to the law of the Lord. That's a wonderful thing, isn't it? When... The ministers can devote themselves to the things that they should be doing. Verse 5. As soon as the command was spread abroad, the people of Israel gave in abundance the first fruits of grain, wild, grain, wild, grain wine, oil, honey, 
And of all the produce of the field, I invented a new food then, didn't I? <laughs> and they... Danny! It's not that funny. <laughs> oh, it is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And they brought in abundance, they brought in abundantly the tithe of everything. And the people of Israel and Judah who lived in the cities of Judah also brought in the tithe of cattle and sheep and the tithe of, dedicated, of the dedicated things that had been dedicated to the Lord their God and laid them in heaps. In the third month they began to pile up the heaps and finish them in the seventh month. When Hezekiah and the princes came and saw the heaps, they blessed the Lord and his people Israel. Hezekiah questioned the priests and the Levites about the heaps. Azariah, the chief priest who was in the house of Zadok, of the house of Zadok, answered him, Since they began to bring the contributions into the house of the Lord, we've eaten and had enough, and have plenty left, for the Lord has blessed his people, so that we have this large amount left. Then Hezekiah commanded them to prepare chambers in the house of the Lord, and they prepared them, and they faithfully brought in the contributions, the tithes, and the dedicated things. The chief officer in charge of them was Conaniah the Levite, with Shimei his brother a second, while Jehiel, Azaziah, Nahath, Asahel, Jeremoth, Jozabad, he had a brother called Jozagud, by the way, Eliel, Ismachiah, Mahath, and Benaiah were overseers, assisting Conaniah and Shimei, his brother, by appointment of Hezekiah the king and Azariah, the chief officer of the house of God. But you do realise that I was joking then, don't you? <laughs> he doesn't re didn't really have a didn't really have a brother called Josagud. That was just my dad joke. Do you, do you have dad jokes in your family? Yes. Are they really bad? I don't. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Are your dad's jokes really bad? No. Uh, oh, okay. Kind of. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, let's get back to verse 14. Everyone's eyes on verse 14. And Kor, the son of Imnar, the Levite, keeper of the East Gate, was over the free will offerings of, to God to apportion the contribution reserved for the Lord and the most holy offerings. Eden, Miniamin, I had a brother called. Jeshua, <laughs> 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 I can say I'm going to have to rein in the statue. <laughs> Jeshua, Shemaiah, Amariah, and Shechaniah were faithfully assist assisting, <laughs> assisting him in the cities of the Levites to distribute the portions to their brothers, old and young alike, by divisions, except those enrolled by genealogy, males from three years old and upwards, all who entered the house of the Lord as the duty of each day required for their service, according to their offices by their divisions. The enrolment of the priests according to their fathers' houses, that of the Levites from 20 years old and upwards, was according to their offices by their divisions. They were enrolled with all their little children, their wives, their sons and their daughters, the whole assembly, for they were faithful in keeping themselves holy. And for the sons of Aaron, priests who were in the fields of common land belonging to their cities, there were men in the several cities who were designated by name to distribute portions to every male among the priests and everyone among the Lev Levites who was enrolled. Thus Hezekiah did throughout <coughs> all Judah, and he did what was good and right and faithful before the Lord his God. Every work and every work that he undertook in the service of the house of God and in accordance with the law of the commandment, seeking his God, he did with all his heart and prospered. Mm -hmm. Now, all right, just before we go to Revelation, let me say a word or two about this. Because, what do we see here? All right, what we've got going on here is really wonderful. We were talking on the way here about where to go in the Bible for principles to manage people. It's difficult, isn't it? 
But right here, you could come to a chapter like 2 Chronicles 31. Actually, there's lots in Chronicles about organizing people. And people need organizing, don't they? Even if they're in the classroom, they need organizing, don't they? Everyone has to know their place. And everyone has to know their job. And it's the, it's the wonderful job that Hezekiah did here, telling the priests and the Levites and everyone, okay, you get on with this, everyone. Did you notice in verse 19, if you want principles, they were designated by name. They knew. Ah, it's my job today. I must do this. That's good management, isn't it? It's really, I mean, you can come to the Bible and say, we've got everything we need here to learn the principles to do things well. However, what do you see that's above and beyond that? What you see that's above and beyond it here is that what Hezekiah did, he did with all his heart, seeking his God. That's what you need more than anything, isn't it? Wouldn't that change everything if... Look, look we, we, we can think, okay, I mean, we're not the people of Israel, we're not the land of Israel, we don't have this job to do, but we do have to organize a church and our ministries and our lives. If we did it seeking the Lord, and if we did it with all our heart, mm. and if we took these principles, mm. things would change, wouldn't they? Mm -hmm. We can think of something like, organizing a cleaning rotor in the church is something very ordinary. It's like, oh, wow, it's just, it's just that. It's just ordinary things. But actually, if we do it to the Lord, and if we do it with all our heart, then it can be wonderful. Yes. And, and this is wonderful. I love it. Yeah. All right. Um, Revelation? Are you ready for, for some revelation? Some revelation from revelation. Are you not too little to do family Bible time? No. I don't think you are. I think you're doing amazing. Well done. Amazing. Well done, Danny. Well done, Danny. Yes, absolutely. Oh, did I just make your table go up? Is it? Okay. What chapter? 17. 17. Oh, I'm there. Wonderful. <laughs> Revelation chapter 17. Are you ready for it? Okay, where are we? We're in the book of Revelation. Right? Where are we? We're in the kitchen. Yes. Where, where, are, where are we in the book of Revelation? All right, we're going through. We just, we just had the seven bowls of wrath poured out. Maybe you missed it today because we only recorded it yesterday. You've been at church all day. But you'll see that in Revelation chapter 16. Now, the seventh bowl has just been poured out. And now in chapter 17, we pick up the story with the judgment of God upon this strange creature a strange bug. <coughs> What's your problem, dog? Maybe <laughs> lie down. This dog's barking. All right, shush. <laughs> she would have gone to the door, it's fine. I don't think there's some, someone at the door. All right. Back to normal. When I said it could be a fox, of course. When I said strange creature, maybe she barked. Maybe I said, this, this woman sitting on a beast and sitting on many waters. So you're going to see some very strange things here. But do you remember in the book of Revelation, a lot of it is very amazing pictures which have a meaning for us, which we're going to try to understand, okay? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you before we get there that... I am not completely sure what it means, okay? I'm just going to tell you that, because maybe you'll get to the end and you'll think, Tom, you've just given us two different options, and you haven't told us which one. Well, you know, 
This is one of those chapters that I'm not completely settled on, so I'll give you both pictures that are in my head, both my understandings that I have, and I'll just say that's the best I can do. Okay, you ready? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, chapter 17. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw, that means this is a vision, I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads, and ten horns. Now, where have we come across that before? Daniel? Well, yes, Daniel, but also here in Revelation. All right. In, in chapter 13, and I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads. And, and if you go back to chapter uh, 12, and uh, the dragon had... The dragon had seven heads and ten horns. Okay, what's going on here? With seven heads and ten horns, if you take the interpretation from the book of Daniel and, and bring it into here, you would say it's seven kingdoms over a period of time. And the ten horns are ten kings. And we get that made, made pretty clear. In this chapter, it's actually made explicit because we get some interpretation from the angel. But there are interesting features here because we've got a woman and she's sitting on this beast it's a scarlet beast and it's full of blasphemous names and it has seven heads and ten horns and verse 4 the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet that's the color of royalty and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery. Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints. In other words, she's killed a lot of Christians the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled greatly. It's all right, the dog's gone now. She's in the other room. It's okay. When I saw her, I marveled greatly. But the angel said to me, why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. And at this point, we all say, oh, phew, the angel's finally going to explain this whole thing. Great. <laughs> okay, here we go. But it's, it's understanding the explanation, that's where there's some difficulty. Okay. For me, anyway. I will tell you the mystery of the woman of the beast, and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. The beast that you saw, so it's going to explain the beast first, was, <coughs> and is not, and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. Okay. What's that about? Okay. And the dwellers on earth, whose names have been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, will marvel to see the beast. Because it was, and is not, and is to come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. There are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he does come, he must remain only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is an eighth, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to destruction. And the ten horns that you saw 
are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. These are of one mind and hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with him are called chosen and faithful. And the angel said to me, The waters that you saw, where the prostitute is seated, are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And the ten horns that you saw, that they and the beast will hate the prostitute and will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it in their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. Okay. So did you get all that? <laughs> this, okay, this is, happens to be one of the most difficult chapters in the Bible to interpret. And, and yet it's, it is an interpretation already because the angel is interpreting the pictures and we ought to at least gain some things from this because... Look, we're trying to understand Revelation as a whole. Um, we could start at the end and say, ah, it's simple. And then I'm going to say, oh boy, even on that point, um, I, I'm not quite clear. So verse 18, and the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. Now, to the readers of John in the first century, when they read that, who would you think that they would have thought that that meant the great city that has dominion over all the kings of the earth? Right. Rome. Okay, so in my Bible in the margin, I write, I wrote Rome. I wrote Rome because Rome was the great city that seemed to have dominion, to have rulership over all the other kings of the earth. Yes? Is it Babylon? Well, John MacArthur says it's Babylon. And he said, well, okay, I didn't get that. But then he, is, he says that there's going to be a revived city of Babylon. Babylon. It's not just John MacArthur. I'm just saying our friend, he's amongst a group of people who interpret it as Babylon. And I'm just going to say to you, I'm not sure yet. Um... I can read it both ways, but I've got problems with both. I think um, I think MacArthur's position is probably the safest and most consistent. But I can read this whole chapter and interpret it around Rome. <laughs> and then I come to some <coughs> points, just a couple of points, and I think, oh, that doesn't quite fit. All right. Is this difficult to follow? Mm -hmm. You can yes. nod. It is difficult to follow, isn't it? I mean, you're 10, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I'd even <coughs> heard of the book of Revelation when I was 10, so you're streaks ahead. This is really hard, isn't it? What do we get from this? Can you, can you hang on for a moment whilst we think, whilst we grown-ups talk about this? Yes. Yeah. You listen in and get what you can. What do we get from this? Let's just look at it for a minute. And, and think about this picture. It's a woman. This woman is pictured as a prostitute, the mother of prostitutes. And prostitution is obviously selling yourself for certain activities. In the Bible, Israel is often pictured as a spiritual prostitute. When she's unfaithful to God, she's selling herself to other religions. Mm. And so historically, people have come to this chapter and said, ah, now this makes sense because the prostitute is then the Roman 
class you? How many are we up to? No. The, the prostitute is the Roman, <laughs> the Roman Catholic Church. So they say the prostitute is the church, the false believing, the false Christian church, which has sold itself to the world. Mm. And so you've got a picture here of a false religious organization, let's say the Roman Catholic Church, which has given itself, bless you, which has given itself <laughs> to, to the world. And so the, the prostitute is sitting on the beast. And the beast, you know, don't you, is the world system. And it's got seven heads, so seven successive world kingdoms. Five have fallen, one is, and, and one is to come. So five have fallen, so the seven world, the seven world powers that dominated the land of Israel down through the centuries were what, Egypt, and then Assyria, and Babylon, and Medo-Persia, and then Greece. Rome, Greece. Uh, Greece, there's five, five have fallen, one is, that's Rome, that's six, and then one is still to come, and that's going to be the revived Roman Empire, the kingdom <coughs> of the Antichrist, that's to try to understand this um, in that way. So we say the beast is the political power that then the religious, corrupt religious power sits upon. And, and when in verse 9 he says, this calls for a mind of wisdom, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. They are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen, one is, and the other is not yet to come, not yet come, and when he does come, he must relain, remain only a little while. That's again interpreted to be the kingdom of the Antichrist, a short time. Um, as for the beast that was not and is not, and it is an eighth, but belongs to the seven and goes to destruction. So that's thought to speak about the um, then the Antichrist. The, the, the kingdom of the Antichrist, if you go back to verse 8, the beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. Well, um, one, of the, one of the difficulties is in, in interpreting this is, is saying, well, what period of time are we looking at when John is, when John is receiving this vision? Are we looking at a period of time in the future, so when he says was and is, was and is not and is to come, are we looking at this specific period of time in the future? So the was part is still future for us. And so it, it does take a lot of care in interpreting it, and I think that's probably the best way to interpret it. Are you able to follow any of this? Uh, I think you're okay over there in the corner. You just sneeze, sneeze and away. blow away. <laughs> okay. Is, is anyone... Ten, ten what? Sneezes. Ten sneezes. We should be fine now. Mm -hmm. Is anyone following me? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Really? Absolutely. I'm in a maze because I'm not sure I'm following myself. <laughs> okay. Then you've got this fantastic scenario here where there's these ten horns, verse 12. Um, the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who've not yet received royal power. But they are to receive royal authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. He said, okay, what's this about? Now, this seems to fit with the ten horns, um, the ten horns that have been spoken about before. A tenfold power structure which if you take this view of all of this as being future, which I do, you have to say, look, okay, this is talking about a time in the future where there will be a ten, a, a, a power structure in the world with, with ten power centers. Mm. 
Now, a lot of people get very excited about that because they say, oh, look, the World Economic Forum and um, the European Union have all agreed on dividing up the world into 10 regions. I don't know what to make of that. Maybe that's the beginnings of the laying of the foundations for this. But I'm just going to say, I don't know. I'm not going to say that's it. I'm just going to say, we'll get there when we get there. Mm -hmm. Because well, it can't take any direction after you, Well, we, we know, we'll know when we're there, won't we? I'm hoping that we won't be right here. But the people who are reading this, when, when, if this fits, if the cap fits, wear it. If this, if this description fits the world that you're in, it has to fit perfectly. Mm -hmm. What you can't do then is squeeze the bit like Cinderella's shoes. You can't squeeze the bits that don't fit on and just wish that they would fit. You can't do that with the Bible. Okay. So it, it all has to fit. And that's some of the problems that I have is I'm, I'm trying to juggle these things in my mind. And I maybe struggle and can't keep it all in my mind at the same time enough. And I get to the point where I'm just like, I'm not sure that that all quite fits. And then I come to it again, and I think it does. And then I come to it again, and I think, I'm not sure it does. <laughs> so I'm just going to say that my own, my own understanding of this is not clear. And if you, if you can't live with that, well, you need someone else to teach you the Bible every single day of the year. <laughs> <laughs> because it would take me, yeah. I, I've spent some time on this, and I've read it year after year after year. But it would take me a long time of studying this, probably, to come to conclusions about some of those questions. Okay. Um, to settled conclusions. I'm just going to give you the best I can. Now, what about these ten kings? Well, they're not, they've not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour, brief time, mm. together with the beast. These are of one mind, verse 13 and hand over their power and authority to the beast. So if you take this picture, you've got world powers who are handing over their power and authority to the revived um, kingdom of the Antichrist, the revived Roman Empire, kingdom of the Antichrist. They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them, for he's king, Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And those with him are called chosen and faithful. Verse 15, the angel said to me, the waters that you saw where the prostitute are seated, is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And the ten, ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute and they will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. Okay, stop here for a moment. Whether you interpret the prostitute as the Roman Catholic Church, or whether you interpret it as a kind of a world religious system centered in Babylon, a revived city of Babylon, that's what I can't decide on. Which of those you interpret it as, it doesn't matter, what the picture you've got here is of these ten kings collaborating with the beast, that's the, the kingdom of the Antichrist, I think it's going to be a revived Roman Empire with the, with the Antichrist at the head. You've got the ten powers joining power with the beast and turning on, turning on the prostitute, turning on the false religious system. Now, for me, then, that bit, this begins to make some sense because I see the picture of the false prophet and it's making the false prophet that we read about in Revelation chapter 13, the second beast, who joins in the work of the beast, the first beast, who's the Antichrist, the false prophet makes the world worship the dragon mm. and worship the beast and makes an image of the beast. Mm. So the false prophet is like the false religious, represents the false religious organization that is set up uh, and the picture that begins to emerge, I think, in chapter 17 is of a worldwide false religious organization, maybe the Roman Catholic Church or a version of it, 
which collaborates with the beast, but then eventually the, these world powers, the kings who receive their power for, for just a short period of time with the beast, they all turn on the religious organization and they tear it to bits. That's the picture here. And, all right, then at the end, you were back to verse 18, and you say, the woman that you saw is the great city, that great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. Okay, so is it Rome? Well, it kind of fits with Rome. Verse 9, this calls for wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains. Rome is built on seven hills on which the woman is seated. So the woman, if that's the Roman Catholic Church, she's seated on seven hills in Rome. But the Roman Catholic Church didn't exist in John's day. But maybe John's seeing into the future and seeing all this. Are you with me with some of the difficulties? Mm -hmm. So, this calls for wisdom. <laughs> I just obviously don't have enough of it. Um, there are also seven kings. So it seems like it, if it's Rome, it seems like it's a kind of combination of all these political empires, all the ones from the past. It's the Roman, um, it's the one world Roman system. Um, it's the one. So the, the woman is seated on seven mountains and seven kings. That's the beast. Well, the woman, if the woman is the, is, is the Roman Catholic Church, then she's seated on Rome, but she's also seated on the the seven kings, that's the succession of empires down through the ages, including the, the Roman, revived Roman Empire at the end. Okay. What if it's Babylon? Verse, seven, verse 18 again. The woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. MacArthur makes the point. He believes that the best interpretation, I think this is driven by chapter 18 rather than chapter 17, he believes the best interpretation is that it is not Rome, but Babylon, and that there will be a revived city of Babylon, which will become the head of the Antichrist's kingdom. I'm just going to say again, we'll get there when we get there. If someone starts rebuilding Babylon, <laughs> which by the way they've talked about doing in Iraq, they've been rebuilding it as a city. Saddam Hussein started rebuilding it as a city, but it ain't nothing like this yet. If someone starts rebuilding that and making it the center of a world system, you're going to know, aren't you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's going to help. So hopefully if you're watching this in years to come and we're long gone and there's a city called Babylon and it's the center of the world, you'll understand <laughs> what we're talking about better than we do. Okay, so now you've seen... Now you've seen... The, now you've seen the pastor of your church meet his matchstick meet his match <laughs> he, he, met, he met his match in the bible so see we don't understand everything can we but do you know what I'm going to keep trying until I've got it clear and I hope I've given you a bit more clarity let's pray father in heaven we pray that you will give us clarity. We pray that you'd help us to understand your word. As we keep reading, even tomorrow with chapter 18, we pray for greater insight. We pray that you'd help us year by year, day by day, even to have a clearer understanding of these things. Thank you that our whole salvation doesn't hinge on us understanding this chapter. Mm. Um, we praise you that great truths of your word are clear and unmistakable. Mm. We thank you for Jesus <coughs> and the gospel that children can easily understand. Uh, please help us to understand it all for the sake of your name. Amen. 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 All right. God bless you. We oh, I need to you. do camera queen duty. Merry Christmas. So what we'll say is, all together now, Happy Christmas, not Merry Christmas, we're in England. 
So all together, happy Christmas and see you tomorrow. Happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. See you tomorrow. Bye. God bless.